Good morning. What a great day. <laughs> a nice and cool evening last night, first time in many days. Still a little bit humid, but we needed the rain. We really needed the rain in our valley, so I was grateful for it. I want to continue this uh, teaching on the life and times of Jesus Christ, and we're in the in the Gospels of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Today we're in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. And uh, a very interesting story about the uh, growing up years of Jesus Christ. We actually have very limited biblical teaching on the life of Jesus Christ bet between the time of his birth and then the visit from the Magi, and then the trip to Egypt and back to Nazareth. And then we have this very brief passage that tells us about his growing up. So I think that whatever is in this passage is extremely important for us to pay attention to because we don't have lengthy passages on his childhood, just this limited part. And um, I want to ask you if you find Luke chapter 2, verse 39, and if you're able to stand with me, to please stand for reading God's Word. And you can stand over here. Traditional for me when I'm getting ready to read the, the Bible to pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. I'm like you. I want to hear God's voice. <laughs> I want to hear Him. I'm, uh, I've heard enough of me. <laughs> so I want to hear His voice. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this precious copy of your word. It's in writing so we can read it. God, I'm begging you this morning. We want to hear your voice. Speak through me. Speak to us as we read the verse, the words printed on the page. We want to hear you. And we need you to help us to understand what we read. So, knowing this is inspired and it's without any error, we come to you and say, Lord, make it real to us. Help us to understand it so we can apply it in our life. Not only for ourselves, but so we can teach others how to obey you and enjoy the blessing of walking with you. Thank you, Lord, for your help. I trust you to answer my prayer because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're Luke chapter 2 and we're at verse 39, which says, So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the, the days as they returned, the boy, Jesus, lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So, when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions, and all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So, when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. You may be seated. Is the Lord talking to you this morning? 
talking about how Jesus grew up. You know, most of the most of the artists' depictions of Jesus, which I am sure not one of them is accurate, but most of the depictions of Jesus Christ picture him either as a baby, sometimes a baby in the arms of his birth mother, Mary, or on the cross, or perhaps seated or standing with the children coming up around him. Those kinds of pictures. I've never seen a picture of the teenage Jesus. Never seen one. And yet, there may be one, I just haven't seen it. And I was thinking, we don't know very much about his growing up years, but he did grow up. He didn't, he didn't remain a baby, and he didn't just, he wasn't born 30 years old. He was, he was born as an infant, and he grew up all these years. And this is an interesting passage because it talks to us about Jesus growing up in a family with a father and with a mother. I think if God had thought there was any other family that would be better for him to be raised, he would have been raised in a different kind of home than this. But the home in which he was raised had a father and a mother, parents who raised him, and train him. Apparently he had had good training. Of course you and I understand he's fully God while he's also fully man in the flesh. Unique child. And yet I have to think as good as he was he didn't always completely understand the way we're thinking and so you're going to see it, a touch of that in this passage and the way that he acts and his parents are informed. <laughs> you and I don't, would have a problem with that. It says, when they performed all things according to the law of the Lord. And by the way, Jesus Christ came and he fulfilled all of the core requirements of the law, of the word of God. He is without sin. He was without sin from the time he was born all the way through this life on this earth. But you know, he lived before that. He was without sin before that, and when he was on the earth, he was without sin, and he remains without sin for the rest of eternity. He'll never commit any sin. That's Jesus Christ. But it says in the, and it says, and they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth, and, the, and he grew and he became strong in several ways. One is strong in spirit, one is filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And you know that he's just a child now. He's, he's this extremely wise, godly child, God-fearing child. And, uh, and it says, and God, the grace of God was upon him. And then in verse 41 it says, his parents went to Jerusalem every year. You know, his, his parents, we would say today, took him to church. I've run into parents today that say, uh, they want their children to be free to make their own decisions. How many of you think it's great to take children and say, go make whatever decisions you want to make, and we'll watch and see what happens. Anybody uh, want to take me up on raising children to do whatever they want? Nobody? You guys are a bunch of sourpusses, you know? You just take all the fun out of life. I remember our youngest son told me one time, he said, you know, Dad, you won't let me ride dirt bikes and do wild and crazy things. He would ride them off of a roof if he could. <laughs> but he could never understand why I wanted to know where are you going, who are you going to be with, what are you going to be doing. He says, when I have kids someday, I'm going to let them do whatever they want to do. And I thought, this will be fun to see how long that lasts. But his parents went up every year. They took him to Jerusalem to, temp to the temple to worship. I am sure in the little village of Nazareth that they took him to synagogue and that he had to sit there and be quiet. He couldn't run around. He couldn't say, I don't want to go to synagogue today. I have a hunch that he probably, Jesus, came and sat with his parents and listened to Mary and listened to Joseph. And when it was time for him 
to go into the carpenter's shop with Joseph. I am sure he went in the carpenter's shop and he did what he was told. Bring me that wood, bring me that saw. I need the I need that drill over there. I need the glue. I need the you know, I want you to practice drilling. I want you to practice hammering uh, the, the wood together and so forth. I am confident that Jesus Christ worked alongside of Joseph, helped his mom in the house, probably took the trash out when he was told. And yet we run into this instant here where he does something which is completely not acceptable to his parents, certainly. And so this is a story about his youth, and it's the only biblical record, as I said. Now, up to this point, just a quick review, Mary had given birth to Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. And uh, I believe that it was sometime before the year zero, it was probably around 3 uh, BC, something like that, and when he was born, and uh, so it doesn't matter too much about the year. And the first year or two, they were still in Bethlehem while he was raised, being raised. And the Magi came there. The star led them there. God sent a star. The star, I believe, everything literally in the scriptures. So the star came. They followed the star. They came to Bethlehem. They uh, worshipped him. They get left gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh with uh, Mary and Joseph for Jesus. And uh, then they went on back another way and went back to where they came from. And we know that part of the story. We also know Herod, the king, was very threatened by the birth of this baby. There are, unfortunately, in the world today, many people who are threatened by the birth of babies. And it's a lack of understanding that each child is created by God and has tremendous intrinsic worth as a human being created to reflect the image of God. Each little boy and each little girl, I know they can be little dickens, I know that. But the, we're supposed to raise them up to come to know Him, the Lord, and to know they can trust Him, and to learn to put their faith in Him, and to obey Him, and to walk with Him in the kind of life that He has for them. And when they're trained that way, the children have a lot better chance in this world of being what we say successful in different ways of life. It's not easy to raise children, and especially in the world we live today, it's not easy at all to raise children. But King Herod was troubled. He was very troubled that this baby had been born. He had heard the Magi told him he was going to be the king of the Jews. And so he ordered that all baby boys of the age of Jesus and younger would be put to death. He's about two years old and younger. So God sent an angel to warn Joseph about this and to tell him to go to Egypt. And so Joseph and Mary and the baby packed up immediately and they traveled down to Egypt. And then Herod didn't live very long. He was very ill. He died a horrible death. And when he died, an angel was sent by God to tell Joseph, okay, pack up your stuff and go back, this time, go back to Nazareth, their hometown. And as they were traveling through Judea to Galilee, they ended up settling in Nazareth. And I want to show you a map real quick. Maybe. <laughs> you see Nazareth up at the top? That blue over to the right there, that's the Sea of Galilee. So between Nazareth and the Sea of Galilee would be the city of Tiberias, right on the west side of the Lake uh, of Galilee, Sea of Galilee. And then the route, that's one of the routes. You see how mountainous that is? Nazareth is at a lower elevation than Jerusalem. And it's almost always they talk about going up to Jerusalem or going down to wherever they're going from uh, Jerusalem. And Bethlehem is just about five or six miles further south of Jerusalem. But that's, that's the distance. Where they were is a little bit to the left, lower part off the map in Egypt. That's where they were, and now they're going to travel back up to Nazareth. And that's the, where the story picks up in this passage. It says, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, and Galilee was a region. It wasn't just a lake, it was the region around the lake. 
And, and they return back and they settle there in Nazareth. And I was thinking, it's been maybe three years or so that they've been gone from their hometown. And the carpenter shop, I wondered, was it still there? Had people protected their stuff while they were gone? Because they left, supposed to go through the census, have a child, and then come back. Never came back for one year, two years, three years. I was wondering, was the shop still there? I don't know, doesn't say anything about it, but he was out of work for a while. I wondered if he had to buy new tools, was he making, did he make things while he was in Egypt, Joseph? I don't know. But he wasn't the kind of a man to just lay around. But whenever God told him to move, he got up and moved. He didn't argue with God, he didn't say, isn't there some other way, or I'm kind of used to Egypt now, or I'm used to Bethlehem. He just went, and he went back to Nazareth. And uh, he grew up. Jesus was growing up in this little town of Nazareth. His birth father is God, so his kind of stepfather, Joseph, the one who was raising him, is raising him in this kind of a normal family, a nuclear family with a father, a mother, and a child, and they had other children, of course. And after Jesus' birth, which was miraculous by the Holy Spirit, there's nothing really supernatural recorded about Jesus until he's 30 years old and begins his, begins his public ministry. But I think there's some important things. Don't just skip over this little passage and say, well, there isn't too much there. It's not interesting. To me, it's remarkable the fact that Jesus Christ was born into a family raised in a family, and he didn't begin his public ministry until he was 30 years old. So he had lived a lot of life. He'd been in Bethlehem, Egypt, back to Nazareth, and all these things happening before he was baptized by John the Baptist at about the age of 30 and began his public ministry. So Jesus Christ spent a lot of time, and he spent time with a, what we call a normal family, a nuclear family with a father, mother, and and uh, siblings even in the home. He's the only one that was born by the Holy Spirit, conceived by the Holy Spirit of God, of course, and the rest were normal uh, children. <laughs> but he was fully God, fully man, raised in this home. And I want you to just try to get this picture. They probably had a simple little home. I imagine some of the furnishings in the home were made by Joseph himself. He had grown up knowing that if something was broken, Joseph would probably fix the neighbors first. That's the way all carpenters are. They always fix everybody else's stuff and they get to their own place last. But I'm sure that he could fix things and make things. And Jesus grew up pretty handy. I'm sure he learned a lot from Joseph in that little town of Nazareth. Pretty protected life considering what he was about to face when he begins his public ministry. But God established the family way back in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and their children. And their children, they couldn't even blame the deacon kids for their own misbehavior. You know, I have no excuse. I was a deacon first. And having been a Baptist deacon and then a pastor, I have no excuse whatsoever. <laughs> I can't blame anybody. Philippians 2 talks about Jesus and it says something about his character. It says, who being in the form of God didn't consider it robbery. Robbery means something to be grasped of God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. That means the appearance of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. There is no person who is more humble than Jesus Christ to put off his visible appearance of glory. I mean, I, I think if we were planning to come and if, if we were in his position, would we humble ourselves and be born in the flesh? It's actually the only way he could accomplish the purpose was to die for us, was to be living in a human body. What humility for him to do that for us and he was raised in this simple little town, not in the capital city. He wasn't raised in Jerusalem. He only went to the temple on occasion. 
And I have to be thinking the whole time when he came, do you wonder how much he knew and understood? When he came to the temple for the first time, was that child thinking, someday the priests here who don't understand who I am are going to falsely accuse me, have me arrested, have a mock trial, and I'll be crucified over on that hill over there called Golgotha, Mount Calvary. Don't you wonder what this child was thinking? Jesus, fully God, and yet living in the flesh, every time he had to go past Mount Calvary, every time he came to the temple, Three times a year, the men by law were required to come to the temple to worship. Every time he came on that trek, year after year after year, he knew the day was coming closer and closer for his own suffering and death for us. Well, every child must learn to know and serve God. I believe that when parents do not follow through on the responsibility to train children to know Jesus Christ, to put their faith and trust in Him, to learn the Word of God, to learn to obey the Word of God. It's a huge mistake on our part as parents and grandparents not to teach our children about Him. Huge mistake. America today is facing many problems. One of the reasons we have so many problems in our nation today is we have so many children and young people who have never been trained to know Jesus Christ. They don't know Him. They've heard about Him. And a lot of what they're hearing today is ridicule and blame. Christians are being blamed for many of the things that are wrong in the United States of America today. People think we're crazy. We're extremists. And the truth is, we're the only ones, if you're born again, who has knowledge and wisdom of the truth of God. We know the way to eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And those who do not know Christ don't understand the ways of a Christian. America cannot remain as it was in its glory days when the majority of the people in the nation do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior because the ways we make decisions seeking God's wisdom, the ways we choose to live our life are so distinctly different when we are knowledgeable of God and His Word. His Word is the source of wisdom in our life. He affects how we live, what we do and what we don't do. And uh, without that training, then our nation is in peril as well as the families are in peril. Anyway, Jesus hung around in Jerusalem, and when the family, it was traditional, when the families would finish the Passover, all the parents would gather their kids, and they'd get in a big caravan, and they'd take caravans back to their city, wherever they went. So there was probably one headed up toward uh, Nazareth, and the parents and the children and all got on their, got their animals and their stuff all packed up, and they were heading back in the caravan, and his parents had done this before with him. And I think Jesus was probably a very, very well-behaved child. And they probably assumed, as they should have been able to do, that he was in the caravan, but he wasn't. He stayed behind in the temple. One day later, they're looking for Jesus. Uh, has anybody seen Jesus? I want you to stop and think about it. If you had been entrusted by God <coughs> to raise his son in this world, and you were doing your best to train your child and raise, raise this child, the Son of God, in your home. And you were being faithful and obeying the law and taking him to the temple as all the males were supposed to go three times a year and so forth. And, and this was Passover. He was, they were there. And on the way back, you can't find Jesus. I was thinking about the Garden of Eden. Remember when Adam and Eve were hiding from God? And I was thinking, when they were looking for Jesus, did they ever stop and say, uh, God, uh, we lost Jesus. Uh, we thought he was with us, but he's not with us, and we don't know where he is. Uh, could you send another star down, and uh, maybe 
lead us to wherever Jesus is because but they, it doesn't say they ever talked to Jesus about it. I think they were desperately running around Jerusalem and I've been running in Jerusalem on those stone streets. And you know what? It's not easy. And I was thinking they looked for him at least one, two, up to three days. They were looking for him. It says on the third day. I don't know if that was third day from the time they left or three days in Jerusalem, but it was too long. And they finally found him. And I have to think that in their humanity, mom and dad were really, really, really glad to find Jesus. And then they were mad. I mean, I could understand that. Because God had kind of placed his son into their care and they lost him. And they also had a deep abiding affection for Jesus. He was also their son. Raised him in their home. And when Jesus was missing, don't you imagine they were upset with him and worried? Uh, Mary, what are we going to tell God? <laughs> I mean, I know he's busy up there. Maybe he didn't notice for a day. I haven't talked to him. Have you talked to him? No, I haven't talked to him. But I was just wondering how that went in that conversation between them. Anyway, it's supposing they've been the kind of, they went the day's journey and they sought him and couldn't find him, and they came back. And I was thinking, they discovered that Jesus is missing. Now today we have amber alerts. We have flashing neon signs or LED signs over the freeways. Looking for Jesus. Jesus is missing. He's lost. But they didn't have any means to do anything like that. Can you imagine? There might have been a million or more people in Jerusalem and they're trying to find one 12-year-old boy. And they look everywhere except the one place where he would be found. At the temple, speaking to the religious leaders, asking them questions, I think leading questions, rhetorical questions, and then answering his own questions. <laughs> I would love to have been there, but I was thinking, I think they went through some pretty anxious moments. Have you ever lost a child? Anyone in here ever lost a child? You've lost a child. Oh my goodness, there's quite a few that have lost a child. <sighs> you had to be in a panic. You had to be in a panic. When you lose your child. I remember Emmy went on a trip one time in the airport. And uh, it was just one time, I think. But she had, they each had a backpack. And they each had identical hats. Identical backpacks, identical hats. And halters with leashes. <laughs> I thought it was a pretty smart idea. Those kids were not going to get more than about three feet from mom. But she was in the airport. And then another airport, I think. And then she got her way down to Louisville where her mom was living then and she had those kids under tow they had all their stuff on their back and uh, they were tied to mom <laughs> I thought good idea but Jesus wasn't you know when a child's missing you're wondering are they safe what are they doing what's somebody yeah who took them what if somebody's doing something to my child I gotta ask a question, it wasn't in my notes. Is there anyone in here that's lost a child and never found that child? Anyone? Lost a child, never found your child. I'm glad. No one raised your hand, I didn't see it. I'm thinking how awful that would be. This story has a happier ending than that. Because Jesus is found. Praise God. Mary and Joseph were really glad they found him. Jesus was amazing, the scholars there, when they found him. It says, it was after three days they found him in the temple, in the midst of the teachers. I mean, they were so one mixed up, like so excited and happy they found him, and so mad that he'd been gone and hadn't told them where he was. All, all in the same thing. And it says he was sitting there and he was listening and asking them questions and all who heard him were astonished. 
The Greek tense there suggests the teachers of the law were not just amazed once, but they were. It means he's, they were repeatedly being amazed at his wisdom. He, he didn't just ask them one good question. It wasn't like, "Are you smarter than a what third grader? Is that fifth grader? See, I don't even know what grade they're in. Fifth grader." Are you smarter than a fifth grader? But Jesus was asking questions that stumped the scholars, the priests, the teachers of the law in the temple in Jerusalem. And he was enlightening them to things that they hadn't thought about before. And he was 12 years old. <laughs> Wouldn't you have loved to be there and heard that? Wouldn't that have been something? When they saw him, verse 48 says, they were amazed. His mother said, son... Why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. There's something really interesting in the play in this. Don't miss it. I think they were amazed and worried at the same time. I think they had some mixed feelings there. <laughs> and I'm glad they didn't have to say, Sorry, God, we lost him and never did find him. But Jesus had been a very responsible, trustworthy child, and I think it would be even more disturbing for him to be missing. If you had a perfect child who had never done any tricks, antics, never lied to you, always told the truth, always done all the things you asked him to do, and that child was missing, and if you have a child like that, yeah, nobody, huh? Uh, yeah, but if anybody had a child like that, and that child, the one who was the really good one, was missing, you'd be very upset. You'd just know there's something wrong because they never do that. And I think as the time passed and the alarm went and, and all, you get pretty angry. And she speaks and she says, why have you done that? The word there was basically, we have sought you anxiously. It refers to deep mental anguish and pain. When they were looking for Jesus Christ, it wasn't just a minor thing. They were really upset and hurting. Jesus responded with a question. And it says he thought Mary would have remembered who he was. He almost is like this little child, very intelligent, more than any other human being, who goes, why were you seeking me? Why were you seeking me? He's thinking like, oh yeah, people. <laughs> why did you seek me? Didn't you know that, and it says in English, that I must be about my father's business. That's not exactly what it says in the, in the original language, but it's close. We're not exactly sure what he was about. I'll share that with you in just a second. But we also are supposed to be about God's business. Are you about God's business? I've had people say to me, well, I've been there and I've done that, and I've pretty much been about that before and I've done my thing and I'm pretty much done now. Mark's never done. I mean, he does so many different things. And I thank you, brother. <laughs> and I thank Steve today. Steve did a pretty good job, I thought, leading the, the music. He's not used to everything around here yet, but I thought he did a really good job today in the worship. At least I was thinking about the Lord worshiping God this morning. I hope you were. When you come to church, come with an attitude of I want, I want to seek God and I want to worship Him. Anyway, Jesus used the word must. Didn't you know that I must be about my Father's business? And the word must was used a lot by Jesus. He said, I must preach. Or I must, the Son of Man must suffer. Or the Son of Man must be lifted up. In this passage, he says, why did you seek me? Didn't you know? And the word literally there is not what it says, but literally, I must be in the, of my Father. It doesn't say. What would he be in? He could have met, didn't you know I'd be in the temple of my father? He just did a couple things. That totally makes sense. 
Didn't you know I'd be in the temple of my father? It doesn't have the word there. It just says, didn't you know I'd be in the blank of my father? I think that my own thought, his personal opinion, is that he said, I must be in the <laughs> gesturing of my father. The temple makes sense. But either way, it's true because he was also totally about the business and the will of God the Father, right? He introduced a new topic here. My Father. He often, you check it out what Jesus said over and over and over again. He always referred to himself, I mean to his Father as my Father, my Father, my Father. Many, many times Jesus spoke about God as my Father. In fact, that's his term. For his father in heaven is my father. Anyway, verse 50 tells us the truth is they didn't understand what he spoke to them. They weren't able to grasp it. The, the term my father was not the usual term for Adonai Elohim. They wouldn't say the name of God. They would have said Adonai Elohim. Jesus said my father. He didn't say Adonai Elohim. <laughs> and I'm sure he could pronounce the name of his father properly and correctly without error, but he just said, my father. They weren't able to grasp all that. And something else I see in this passage that, that teaches me about families and children, it says, when he, then he went down with them to Nazareth, and he was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. Children are supposed to honor the parents when they grow up. And I was thinking, Jesus may have learned something about them through this experience. That he needed to be uh, patient with his parents and be subject to them. That fulfills one of the commandments to honor your father and mother. And I don't think he was at the temple with the intention of being disrespectful to Mary and Joseph. He was just being about being in his father's house and he was about the, the work of teaching the word. But from that on it says he was subject to them. Did you catch that? He was subject to them. I think he did that as much to fulfill scripture, to honor his father and mother, as also to say, I'm not going to do that again. I won't put him in a position of leaving and they don't know where I am. I think so. Because it was a change. He, the first time he just went and stayed there and he didn't even tell them. And he thought, well, they should know where I am. And then the rest of the time, he says he was subject to them. And Mary just didn't fully understand it. Think about this. She knew, and Joseph knew who he is, because each of them had been visited separately by an angel who told them. But it just didn't sink in. The enormity of who Jesus is and the responsibility that they had to raise the Son of God all of that to these two simple and yet pure people of faith, I think was more than they could fully comprehend, was to have the Son of God growing up in their home, and all the things that he was going to be doing, I think it took a lot for them to absorb and begin to understand it. I'll tell you when it all came together for Mary. At the cross, when she saw The boy who had stayed behind at the temple, now a man, falsely accused. She understood, this is the Son of God, our Messiah, her Savior too, who was on that cross dying for her and for all of us. Jesus. I think the truth of all these things fused together for her when she stood at the foot of the cross. Jesus spoke to her and he, she spoke to John. And John, the beloved disciple, took responsibility to take care of Jesus' mother from that time. I don't think until that time all these things fully came together for her, but it had to at the cross. And oh, when her son rose again, 
doesn't have a story about it. I have to think we could write that story when she saw Jesus risen from the dead. Do you think she'd be one of the first and loudest to shout hallelujah, praise to God for what he has done to send his son to be our savior? I also think there had to be times when she went over all the years of his childhood from the birth and the visit of the Magi. I have to tell you, there's something special about this child. The trip to Egypt, the trip back, the time he's at the temple. All these things in, in, in his life had to come flooding back into her mind. And Jesus, the whole time, it says, increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. He advanced in wisdom. Wisdom is not just having information, it's knowing how to use that information. Wisdom is no, having a fear of God and a determination to be committed to do the will of God with his help. And I'm sure Jesus was. He advanced physically. He grew up. He was a man now. He advanced spiritually in relationship to God the Father, his Father, and also to others. He was filled with grace. It's the grace of God. And he was anointed by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit was with him while he was here. Now the Holy Spirit's also with us. God expects us to grow. Jesus grew up. He didn't remain a baby. I don't know some of your backgrounds, but you may have always thought about Jesus being a baby held in the arms of his mother. If you really just stop and think about it, he had to grow up in order to go to the cross. He became fully a man, and he was fully yet God in the flesh, and he was nailed to a cross, and he was raised up, lifted up, and died for you and me. 